My name is Jörg Rieger, and I'm a theologian. I say that it sounds like an apology, but uh, I think there is something important that the Occupy movement teaches us about theology and about God. Um, I've been working on issues of theology and liberation and resistance and what God calls us to do for the past 20 plus years. Um, when the Occupy movement came around, you know, uh, in some ways uh, we felt some of our hopes, some of our prayers had been heard. And so uh, at that point, uh, some of us started to think theologically, what does it all mean? What can we learn from this? And perhaps what can the Occupy movement then also learn from what is going on uh, in the religious communities? A colleague of mine uh, and myself, uh, Kwok Poulan, and I wrote this book, Occupy Religion. There are a couple of flyers. There are still a few here up front um, reflecting precisely on this question. Um, there are many lessons I think we learned um, in the conclusions, uh, second uh, or fourth and fifth chapter of the book, we're talking about what have we learned about God, what have we learned about the church. I want to talk a little bit about what we learned about God. The first thing we have to realize is that our images of God are also occupied. This is something that, uh, you know, people are using for their own purposes. And what I mean is our images of God are very much occupied by the right, not just the religious right, but also the political right, to such a degree that we now think if you want to be a serious Christian, you have to be politically right. You have to be part of the conservatives. This is an occupation, and I think we have to take our images of God back because this is not the image of God in the Bible. There's something else here that we need to explore. So for instance, when we talk about God, what do we do? Very often we lift our eyes to heaven, uh, we raise our eyes up, and what that means is not only are we lifting up our eyes to heaven, but we're also looking at the top floors of the business buildings, we're <laughs> looking at the top floors you know, of government, uh, we're, we're looking to the high and the mighty, and we're assuming by default that God's right there. That's part of the story. Or when we talk about family values, uh, we assume that family values are the values of conservative America. Now, if you listen to what Jesus has to say about family values, it's a different story. Who are my mother and my brothers and my sisters and maybe my father? Who are these people? Well, it's the people who do the will of God. It's not the people who take away whatever other people have. It's not the people that oppress others. It's the people that care for others, the people that live together in peace. This is my family. Now, hopefully that includes our families of origin, but that's no guarantee. So family values, when Jesus talks about this, looks very different. One of the images uh, that is a very old image uh, that we all know is Jesus Christ is Lord. This is perhaps one of the earliest confessions of the Christians. What does Jesus Christ is Lord look like from the ground up, from the Occupy movement up? The early Christians knew that when they confessed that Jesus Christ is Lord, that meant at the same time that Caesar was not Lord, because this is what everybody else assumed. There is only one Lord, and that Lord is Caesar. So when the early Christians said, Caesar is Lord, they basically said, Caesar is not. So in this situation, when we are saying Jesus is Lord as Christians, perhaps we may have to say the same thing. Jesus is Lord, and the corporation is not. Jesus is Lord. Capitalism is not. Jesus is Lord, and the bosses are not. Jesus is Lord, and those who want to lord it over us are not Lord. So there is something else going on here. There's an interesting little story I want to mention here. In the Roman Empire with these early Christians, they believed that Christians were atheists. And guess what? The Romans were right. Christians were atheists because they refused to believe in the God of the Roman Empire. Well, the gods of the Roman Empire. These were gods, these were figures that sat with the high and the mighty. And they were not only Romans, some of them were Egyptian, some of them were Greek. They came from different backgrounds. But the Christian God would not fit that Roman pantheon because the Christian God did not sit with the high and the mighty. 
story about the Christian God was that he got executed on the cross by the Roman Empire. That was a very, very different God, and this was the atheism. The Romans could not make sense of this God as part of their theism. But the Christians knew they believed in an alternative God. They didn't have to play the old atheism. They found something else that was inspiring that made a difference. Now, some of my friends are process theologians. They argue that God is not like the old theist God. God is not static. You know, God is flexible. God is in movement. God is in motion. You see this in Jesus Christ. God's not sitting still, always walking, always interacting. I think this is very important. There's something else we learned from the Occupy movement, and those of us who are liberation theologians uh, have been thinking about this for a long time. Not only is God not static, but perhaps God is not up there. That's the other thing, you know. God is not with the powerful, the high, and the mighty. Well, how do we know this? Well, we know this in the Christmas story. Jesus, the baby, was born in a manger, grew up being a day laborer in construction. That's what he was, you know. That's what his dad was, day laborer in construction. Was perceived as a threat, this kid, you know. Early on, they didn't like what this was all about, where this was going, and so they got rid of him. Well, they tried to. They didn't quite get rid of him. They fled. They were immigrants, by the way, uh, exiles, you know, uh, into Egypt. Uh, that's, that's where Jesus grew up, uh, spent part of his youth. This is how we know that God's not up there. God's right here. Now, here's an interesting distinction. Theologians often talk about immanence and transcendence. Those are complicated theological terms, and we can impress our students with it. <laughs> Transcendence is really important because it reminds us that God doesn't quite fit our own little lives. God's bigger than we are. You know, this is what transcendence is talking about. But for a lot of theologians, transcendence means, and for Christian people too, God somewhere removed from the world, right? From a distance, God is watching us. In the Occupy movement, I submit to you, we found again a transcendence. God didn't fit our own little games and schemes, but this time transcendence wasn't up there somewhere in the ethereal realm with the angels. But transcendence was right here on the ground, walking with the people, talking with the people, staying in the tents, you know, eating with the homeless. Uh, right there, that was still transcendence. That was another way of, you know, saying that God is bigger than we are. God is bigger than our own little religious imagination. This is something that reshapes us, something that actually makes a difference in a way that's surprising because we don't expect it. Our religions uh, don't quite allow for it. Do I have a little more time? Uh, one more minute? Wrap it how you want. One more minute. The one thing we're talking about uh, in the Occupy Religion book that I still want to mention is a term called deep solidarity. What we are beginning to realize in this talk between the 1% and the 99% is that perhaps more of us are in the same boat than we ever assumed. You know, very often middle class people, we felt we had to put ourselves in solidarity with other people who are less fortunate. We are privileged, they're poor, we are okay, they're not. What we're realizing is we're all in the same boat because the middle class is hurting. You know, some of the numbers uh, we could talk about, uh, so many people have lost their jobs. Over 50% of college graduates under the age of 25 are unemployed. We are more and more in the same boat. And what that means is we are now developing a different sort of relationship. What that means about God is that God is somehow part of this as well. That doesn't mean that God becomes us or we become God, but God is somehow in the mix, helping us push beyond it, helping us make a difference, doing the sort of things that we couldn't do all by ourselves. So deep solidarity here is a call for us to understand how we're in the same boat. And it is a call for the 1% as well. The 1% are not excluded. They're also called to join us in the 99%. Some have done so. This is very impressive privileged people would do that. More will do so yet. We're hopeful. We're praying for it. God can do a lot of things, maybe even that. And so here is the hope of the Occupy movement. We are all together. We're not alone. God is bigger than us. And God 
Jesus Christ, the Lord, will ultimately help us live very different lives from the way we're living right now. We find this hope embodied in the manger. We find it embodied in the streets. And we're grateful for it. Thank you.